Cool. Okay. Hey, everybody. Hey, counseling psychologists everywhere and friends. Um, I'm Carmen Cruz. I, I use she, her pronouns. I'm one of the tri chairs of the Counseling Psychology Conference 2020. Um, I acknowledge that I'm situated in occupied, unceded seas territory of the Wichita, Comanche, and Cherokee tribes. These tribes have stored this land throughout the generations, and we would like to pay our respects to elders, both past and present. Um, as for myself, I'm currently the active president and the internship training director at TW Caps in Denton, Texas. So I'm going to do a brief introduction as to why, um, why are we doing this webinar for those of you who maybe couldn't uh, join us for the first couple. Um, the Counseling Psychology Conference is held every six years. It's co-sponsored by three organizations, um, APA Division 17 Counseling Psychology, ACTA, the organization of, for which I represent, and also CCPTP. Um, obviously, we couldn't celebrate together because of COVID, and we've been through a big, sad process letting that go. Um, but we are very grateful um, that our keynotes throughout the process have agreed to help us host a virtual CPC 75th anniversary. We could not let the 75th birthday of counseling psychology go um, uncelebrated. So we wanted to at least share the highlights. The first one was a presidential panel we had in May, and then we had a keynote by Dr. Love in June. And now tonight we have a panel of black trans activists that we were going to be with in New Orleans. And we're super grateful that they said yes. So super excited about tonight and being together and having this conversation and learning and being called in or forward as needed. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague and friend, Julia Phillips to take us to the next piece. Hey, hi everyone. So I'm Julia and I am the past president of CCPTP, which is the Council of Counseling Psychology Training Programs. And my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am coming uh, to you from Northeast Ohio and want to acknowledge that this land was originally settled by the Erie tribes and then later resettled by the Ottawa, Seneca, and Ojibwe tribes who were then displaced. Um, we are celebrating counseling site tonight as a discipline um, as well as working to enact our values. Um, our values have been traditionally to look at people using developmental lenses as well as contextual lenses. And so historically, this has definitely meant, you know, that we are celebrating diversity of all kinds. Um, and it has increasingly um, meant over the past few decades that we are starting to talk about social justice and working toward enacting um, and liberating people who are oppressed as part of our core values. Um, we do that where we are trying to work toward equity in opportunities, uh, large and small, as well as um, in particularly in education and healthcare, mental health care, um, in the workforce with counseling psychology as traditions in career counseling and career development. Um, and of course, also in all the institutions that we are part of and organizations. So in terms of trying to enact liberation in, go in governance. Um, and of course, in our uh, very important local, state, and federal governments as well. So we're thrilled to have our panelists and our co-facilitators here today to um, help us to continue to enact our values and to work and grow into a stronger counseling quality of the break. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Carmen. My name is Annalise Singh. Uh, my pronouns are she and they. Um, I'm working right now in Atlanta on unceded Crete and Muscogee and Cherokee land uh, and lots of indigenous tribes that were erased to the point that we don't have their names, right? And so that becomes such an important conversation, uh, not backdrop, but a really important part of our conversation tonight. You all are in for a treat. I mean, these are people that I can't even believe we get to just have a conversation with. Uh, the title of tonight's webinar is When We Fight, We Win. I think Tony Michelle will talk a little bit about where that inspiration comes from. Implications for counseling psychology from black trans intersectional liberation movements. We are at the 75th anniversary of counseling psychology and my presidential initiatives in the division of counseling psych have really been about building a counseling psychology of liberation 
how can we really question that the roots of psychology do not start with a white guy named William James that must come from the continent of Africa where all humanity came from, which is likely from a black woman, right? So, you know, I think indigenous cultures, healing traditions, all of those things that we don't usually get to talk about in our discipline, this is the time for us to talk about that tonight. A couple of things before we get started in terms of housekeeping, please like use the chat box. Right now, folks, if you've joined us before, you know we wanna know your name, we wanna know your pronouns, we don't wanna know the indigenous land you're on. We wanna know, especially our moderators as we were talking about, we were wanting to know like, how do we make this a conversation that's not extractive from black trans intersectional uh, communities and movements? So if, whatever you can share of yourself, I think is really important. So I am joined by a couple of amazing uh, people in moderating tonight. I wanna first introduce uh, Dr. Skylar Jackson, who is a researcher, clinician, facilitator, and consultant based in New York City. With a background in counseling psych, Skylar is currently a postdoc fellow at the Yale School of Public Health, where he engages in research and develops interventions related to intersectional stigma, community resilience, and health. Dr. M. Matsuno is currently a postdoc fellow working under the mentorship of Dr. Kimberly Balsam at Palo Alto University. Um, their research goals are really to understand minority stressors and resilience factors that trans and non-binary people experience and develop and test interventions that reduce minority stressors. So um, the three of us are going to be uh, really kind of um, asking some questions, but I think one of the things we want to say to all of our attendees is we want you to engage in these questions too and these answers. All right, so is there anything else, Skylar and M, we want to say before we introduce the panelists? We're good? Sweet. All right, this is the best part. Mariah Moore. Mariah is the Organizing Program Associate for Transgender Law Center. Her work includes fighting to ensure equity, equality, and safety for the trans community, especially Black transgender women. Mariah has worked tirelessly in New Orleans to bring awareness to communities that have been adversely affected by laws and policies that are discriminatory. Folks, uh, she's been part of a movement right now building um, uh, out safe and affirming housing for trans people. I'll be dropping uh, the information about their efforts right now. They're doing some really important fundraising, so we have an opportunity to give. Mariah currently serves on the LGBTQ task force, which was created by New Orleans Mayor Latoya Cantrell. I can't wait to hear about that. Um, she also works with the Cans Can't Stand campaign, which is a campaign that was created to bring awareness to and hopefully abolish crimes against nature law that has historically targeted LGBTQ plus people of color, specifically black trans women. Mariah was also selected as a Victory Empowerment Fellow, which identifies LGBT community members who wish to run for office Please, presidents, <laughs> please, <laughs> yes, please. Tony Michelle is dancing, yes. Who wish to run for office and provide campaign training. Mariah is also involved with Song through the Lord's Work Fellowship. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Jay Celestial Shavers, wow, uh, it is great to see you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Jay is a long-term organizer, born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, politicized in New Orleans. Jay holds over 10 years of training and facilitation experience and has been an active in organizing campaigns in criminalization, policing, deportation, and confinement since 2013. Jay founded Softboy Consulting in May of 2018 in an effort to increase support and growth uh, and development of Black, queer, and trans individuals and organizations. So thank you for being here, Jay. I appreciate it and following your work over time. Um, I know it's been powerful. Uh, my friend and sister, sibling, uh, Tony Michelle Williams, is a performer, storyteller, community organizer, and executive director of Solutions Not Punishment Collaborative, Snap Co. in Atlanta, one of the most powerful groups, I think, in the world right now in terms of social change. As an Atlanta native, she is a celebrated community organizer and beloved in pr prison abolishment, uh, prison reform issues, the criminalization of poverty, um, and Black trans people. 
um, her work on somatic practices, embodied leadership development, music, sound, laughter, spells, and prayers to ignite movement and action has been transformative. Uh, she was the principal researcher and co-author in the release of The Most Dangerous Thing Out Here is the Police, a report for highlighting the experiences of trans people in regards to Atlanta's law enforcement helping shape and change local policies. I'm going to let her talk about her work with the Atlanta Detention Center, but let's just say like shutting down a jail has been part of that and just really bringing awareness to um, how we can end the emotional warfare on black children and misfits around the globe and her words. So thank you, Mariah. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Tony Michelle, for being here. Um, can we give them some love through the chat box? <laughs> um, you know, we don't want this to be a one-way conversation, but we've got to start somewhere tonight. So can you tell us a little bit about who you are and the community organizing work you've been doing to just kind of give us some positionality and maybe we can start with Mariah. I know that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <clears throat> absolutely. So I got into advocacy and activism probably about five years ago initially, but I was really thrust into this work um, by the sudden and tragic uh, murder of my sister, China Gibson. And because I was building up to really um, discovering what my purpose was um, and how I was going to use everything that I had been through as a transformative um, energy within me to save the lives of my sisters and siblings, you know, I was moving there very slowly, but um, as I suffered that, huge loss as we all did here um i kind of realized in that moment that it was my duty to do this work and i had an obligation um because someone else who came before me who was doing this work saved my life right and so um that's where my activism started um i was politicized by so many different activists um you know local activists here um um, like watching the work that was being done at Breakout and um, the beautiful Black trans women who were trying to uh, break through uh, the HIV, um, the HIV care in the city, watching how they worked and then being introduced to Raquel Willis and deepening um, my connections with other national um, activists like Tony Michelle and Aria Saeed and really learning from them um, and, you know, just really finding a path to help this movement here in New Orleans um, find its track, find its footing to get it back on track. I think for a while, you know, we, we kind of slowed down um, and a lot of our elders kind of withdrew and to live their golden years, right? Um, so that's where my work uh, began. That's where it, it now continues. Um, and like I mentioned in my bio, I do a lot of work in the city um, with the mayor's office. I'm here along with Jay. We're, we're working on the House of Tulip, um, you know, and combined with my work at Transgender Law Center, you know, um, learning and growing, even as a person, I don't know it all as a Black trans woman, learning about disability justice and what that access looks like, right? And why I'm here, you know, I'm not a licensed clinical psychologist. I'm not an MD. I don't have a PhD, but I know it's important to be here, to have my voice heard as a Black trans woman and my experiences and the experiences of my community members. That is awesome. Thank you, Mariah. And I'll be dropping uh, links to House of Tulip. Uh, I think Mariah will talk more and Jay, but you know, it's been amazing to watch the fundraising efforts. And folks, right now, part of Getting Right is funding Black trans uh, movements and making sure we put our money uh, underneath uh, these movements. So thank you so much, Mariah. What about you, Jay? What you been up to? <laughs> I knew I was next. Something told me it was me. Um, what's up, y'all? I'm Jay. My pronouns are he and him. Um, and yeah, I, yes, that is a very big question. Um, I feel like I might have a different answer every time somebody asks me, like, <laughs> what what has brought me into me, what my work looks like. I think um, just key things, I think, are important for me to, to be clear around in my work. Um, and that in everything that I do, I try to be abolitionist. Um, 
And so meaning that at the root of just destroying and dismantling um, systems of power and oppression. So whether that be work like House of Tulip, that's actually trying to get um, folks like uh, material needs met in this moment. Folks need housing, we know that. Um, and so we're trying to get that done and also organizing abolitionist campaigns through work um, at Breakout, through work at BYP 100. Um, also just in general, working with other black, queer and trans folks who um, have noticed conditions in our lives that are not okay. <laughs> and I've just been like, actually, nah, we're gonna get it a different way. Um, I definitely I feel very deeply rooted in the Gulf South, not only the South, but the Gulf South, the deep South. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's very important to name. I think I have a, a, a loyalty that not even need to be stated to niggas that know me. Um, that, yeah, I'm, I, the work that I do is, is about uplifting um, the South in particular, knowing that especially queer and trans people um, in the deep South are left out of a lot of conversations, even that we have, right, and talking about um, Black trans lives and talking about trans lives, that is, is people in rural areas that still haven't connected themselves to that language, um, but are living the experiences that we talked about when it comes to access to care, uh, when it comes to access to community and resources. Um, so just want to name that. Um, I'm a Black queer feminist. Um, yeah, which just means that I think in all of the work that I do, it's important to center the uh, lives and experiences of those who have not been. Um, so even as a, as a man, as a Black man, as a Black trans man, um, yeah, there's spaces that I show up in and I'm, I, yeah, I gotta be willing to put my stuff aside and, and recognize where I have access to power. Um, and so it's not always just a, a white and black situation of, you know, are you black and trans? Therefore you deserve, uh, <laughs> and like, yes, all of us do deserve the basic shit. I'm not, I don't mean the, uh, the right to thrive and live. Yes, absolutely. And also, um, just recognizing that I'm not always an expert. So I also consider myself very much a, a student of this work um still i still consider myself very much a baby abolitionist um but all, with the years i feel like i have under my belt i still feel um yeah very fresh to a lot of this so t want to just be humble um yeah and name that as a as an organizer um as an abolitionist as, as a uh, just a black person out here struggling um to change conditions in our communities that i'm very much still learning um and still eager to learn um yeah I thought that's enough. <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> well, and I've so appreciated your, just the cultural humility you bring to your work and all the work you've done with young people and just like the commitment to doing this um, in the deep South and just staying in the deep South, cause it's hard. And I know I've sat at the feet of uh, black and brown trans movements in the deep South. And I feel like I always learn you know, not just how to be a better human, but, you know, to move beyond strategy into liberation, you know, and so that leads me to Tony Michelle, what you've been, you've been up to a lot. <laughs> what have you been up to? <laughs> it's a big question. Tell us about who you are in the community organizing work you've been doing. Yeah. Um, so first, just so happy to share the space with my brother and my sister. Uh, I, you know, embody a thing I like to call for silliness. So I love to laugh and, and, and be silly. So here we are. Um, it literally is the ground for true transformation and the imagination and things. So I'm a girl who believes in all of that from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I started my organizing work in college in Norfolk, Virginia, at Norfolk State um, as a young queer non-binary and the visual um, back in 2009, 2010, when we did not have the language or visibility that we have now. Um, and I had experienced violence on campus and uh, really had to fight, um, had to fight for, uh, for my story to be like recognized and taken seriously. And uh, that fight just stayed with me. Um, and I knew other students on campus had similar experience and, experience. and so we created a student group called Legacy um, and we made our Black, historically Black college gay as fuck for a long time. Uh, and so that's where, that's where we started um, and that's where I started. I was then introduced uh, just national LGBT 
teach students um, who are also Black and also engaging in organizing work. Um, and when I decided to move back to Atlanta, um, I had to survive a little and I engaged in sex work. Um, where I, you know, uh, met so many of my sisters who were homeless, um, who were struggling with mental health issues and substance use and, um, and needed support. Um, and like I said, that fight stayed inside of me and I wanted to make sure that um, I was taking care of folks in my state and in my city um, and have committed myself to that work. Um, and developing the leadership of Black trans folks um, since then. Um, and so here I am now, uh, 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 five years later here at the Solutions Not Punishment Collaborative, uh, again, where I started off as a part-time organizer, um, and now I'm able to serve as executive director. Um, and so we are defunding police right now. We are, you know, supporting uh, most and protests that are in our city, you know, the murder of Ray Sharp Brooks, I'm sure many of you have heard of. Really just the chaos has been Atlanta um, uh, since COVID, and what has been the chaos in Georgia. Um, and It's the perfect way for uh, Tony Michelle to be frozen. <laughs> so we can like lean into the silliness, but I know she'll come back. Um, <laughs> I feel like I got to snap a picture of that and text that to her, right? <laughs> but um, we'll give her you a know, second. I, mean, I, can, I can take us and maybe say yeah. a little yeah. bit, and we can, but we can also come back and uh, get the rest of what I'm sure was, uh, you know, more to share on the good work that Tony Michelle is doing. Um, how's that sound? Perfect, uh, thank you. Yeah, so, you know, this conversation, again, my name is Skylar Jackson, he, him pronouns, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. I was saying before this talk with some of you all how uh, excited I was to be moving beyond just having what is good, that there's more conversation about um, Black trans lives, but beginning to have conversations with Black trans folks. Uh, so I'm excited that we're doing this today. Uh, I wanted to bring up the next question by asking you all on the panel how you define liberation, which is a part of our title today, right? How do you define liberation um, as Black trans folks? Um, and why do you think liberation is important for counseling psychologists like us to take up as a core value. It's another big in, question, huh? In, in no specific order, or just- No specific order. And, and again, I mean, as we're moving throughout this, this can be conversational. You all, not everybody has to answer every question. You can pick what part resonates with you. Um, and so we're interested. So yeah, the two parts again are, how do you define liberation um, mm -hmm. as Black trans folks? And why do you think that that point of liberation is critical for counseling psychologists to take up as a core value? Mm -hmm. And Jay mentioned this earlier, I think we get asked this so much, our answer always changes. But one thing that in, within that answer that remains the same is the, you know, the abolishment of all systems of oppression. Like, you know, um, living in a world where we're not constantly seeing our siblings murdered, um, living in a, in, in a world where, you know, systemic discrimination no longer exists, right? And so where poverty no longer exists, um, these systems go beyond uh, the TGNC community, right? I think it's important for psychologists to center liberation um, or hold it as a value because you know, even with myself, the experiences that I've had, like the ways in which um, psychologists and uh, physicians have weaponized um, things against us, right? And that's rooted in white supremacy and, you know, and, and a lack of, 
fundamental understanding of who we are and how these systems come together to crush us, right? And how, and how they contribute to that, right? And how they cause more harm than they do help, right? And how you're actually taking lives instead of saving lives, right? And so it's so important to be grounded and rooted in it, not just hold it. You have to be rooted in it, right? You have to make it a part of your everyday ritual um, and make a commitment to not only just fighting um, in the clinical world, but you know, within your social groups, right? Within within your communities, right? Within within rooms that we don't have access to. Um, and so, yeah, I think that yeah, that sums it up for me. Tony Michelle, just to bring you back into the conversation, I don't know if you came in before I stated the question or not. Whenever you do share please continue to share where you, were, where, where you were when you got cut off. But I asked the group how they define uh, liberation as black trans uh, folks and uh, why liberation is important for counseling psychologists to hold as a core value. Yeah. Where you gonna go, Jay? What's that? Perfect, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, what does liberation mean to me as a black trans person? Um, you know, I say this all the time around, you know, just, I talk about the magic of black trans people, um, the, the understanding um, and like relationship to like grace, um, like our relationship to like, you know, to grief and having and, and rejection um, and all of those things. And, you know, we, we are the embodiment of liberation. And for me, it is literally like the process in which you are committing yourself to get free. Um, and at any moment, at any moment, at any time, right, uh, you can be liberated, right, what, you know, and it's not this, um, well, I'm going to say it's not, I'm sorry, I'm getting all whimsical, but it is a both and, right, so it is like this seeking and right to freedom from, like, oppressive systems, but it's also, like, a seeking and, like, a, a freedom within yourself, and as queer and trans people, we got to do that work before most or all this heterosexual people have to do that work because we are oftentimes rejected by y'all <laughs> and so and isolated and harmed right uh by y'all and so uh it is it is a process a constant consistent process of just knowing that like uh how freedom lives and exists and shows up in all of its ways and bring and being present for that moment to like have or to feel liberated and be liberated. Um, it's important for psychologists um, because of all of that I just said. And <laughs> in addition to, um, you know, y'all are in a position to facilitate uh, and hold a container for people's transformation and when you hold when you hold when when you are listening and being present from a from a liberated space within yourself that is actually the invitation for them to transform as well and so it's like it's also like a skill that you all need to embody it is it is the quality in which like liberation is like the quality in which you hold the space in the container. And it is, again, the process in which we are constantly facilitating each other through accountability, through like reckonings, uh, through all of the things. I love that piece around the, the real inter, interdependence of liberation and how it's all, we're all tied up in each other's liberation and oppression, um, therefore. Yeah. Appreciate that. Ah, oh, man, y'all gonna make me work hard to be a black man that don't repeat what y'all say on this channel. Um, yeah, I, it's not, it's not a lot I feel like I can add. Um, uh, I think the, what first came up 
for me when you asked the question was um, self-determination, right? I think that the the thing and the beauty about <laughs> Black trans and queer people um, is, yeah, is literally that we are doing the work of determining for ourselves um, what gender looks like, of determining what ourselves, what families look like, uh, what communities look like, uh, what work <laughs> looks like. Uh, so I think that just in, at the root of a lot of the things that we talk about that are the reasons that we don't receive the resources that we should um, is because we take that risk of determining for ourselves um, how we move through the world. And I think for me, um, liberation means that not only us, but all Black people, um, all Black and Indigenous folks are able to determine for themselves um, in all of the ways, right? I think even in, in thinking about specific to um, to care and mental health psychology, I think um, also being able to honor that there's ways in our communities um, that we've like survived and taken care of each other um, and leaned on each other, right? Like before I ever knew anything about psychology or anything like that, like I knew you go to Big Mama or you go to the OG when you got issues or uh, if there's things that you need to be able to break down. And I think to um, us being able to uplift both, like that there are um, benefits that we've gained from these formal systems of care. And also that there are ways that black folks have continued to determine for ourselves what that care looks like. Um, and so I think it's important for, um, yeah, I think it's important for folks who are doing the work that a lot of you are um, to be both working in, um, in collaboration with folks to figure out um, how they are the what like what is the what's the um, opportunities that folks have to determine for themselves right it, throughout your care um, and in your care what's the opportunities that you're creating for folks to make decisions um, and have agency um, in their lives understanding that especially for Black trans people that does not exist in in most facets of our lives. Um, and so that being something that we're able to do when we are seeking care um, in these kinds of ways is, is super important. Um, and I think also y'all actively doing the work um, to learn more about the ways communities are uh, working to provide each other. I think a lot of the services um, that you all have a lot more expertise or different expertise um, around. And I hope that makes sense. <laughs> okay, Tony. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, thank you all so much. So again, I'm M. Matsuno, they, them pronouns. I feel so grateful to be able to be here uh, learning with and from you all. Um, and just hearing about all the amazing work and advocacy that you're doing. Um, so I know you talked a little bit about some of the um, activism that you've been doing. And so the next question, uh, it's kind of broad, but what are some of the challenges that come up for you um, when you're doing that liberation focused um, activism and organizing? Ask it to us one more time. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Sure, no problem. So my, the question is, um, and it's kind of broader, might, you know, we can have some follow up questions, but what are some of the challenges that have come up for you doing this work, this liberation focused activism or what, uh, yeah, barriers or things do you encounter? Um, yeah. Right. Jay, say, say what? Say it. <laughs> I'm off you. Say it. It's us. I'm like, in general, like, just, you know, like, the obstacles over this. Baby, we just gonna take up. <clears throat> but, right. You know, I'll start off. You know, um, there are many obstacles. <laughs> there are many obstacles um, for me, for me. Um, I think one of my biggest obstacles was um, understanding as that, my, understanding my worth and my value from the things that, you know, um, and, and then we'll, so that's like the reflection of the challenge, right, and the barrier. But of course we know that that is impacted by all of the shenanigans and bullshit that, you know, is, that we're impacted by, by white supremacy, patriarchy, and all of the things, right? So, um, but for me, you know, I've definitely had to do a lot of healing work um, and uh, around my worth, um, 
uh, just around, you know, is my thought leadership valuable? Is it, uh, is, is how I'm showing up, you know, am I going to be received well as a Black trans woman, right, by these straight cis head politicians, right? Um, am I going to be, uh, you know, looked at from my community? Am I going to be still seen as a person in community or only seen as a leader in community and not have access to the same amount of care and the same amount of safety um, that the folks that I'm fighting for and work for, right, um, in my community each day? Am I going to be able to be seen as human um, uh, or just a normal girl, right? Um, Am I going to ever be seen as a normal girl? You know, you Google me, all you see is trans activists. Um, and so is that something that I will desire or long for in my growth and transformation in my own, you know, spirit and mind and, and wholeness? Um, so I think that those challenges are the only, those stories, right, that, serve me in a moment or don't serve me at all, like are the biggest barriers because everything else, bitch, you know, I'm gonna shut it down, I'm gonna get you right together. But <laughs> what will prevent me from being able to really enter into that moment, um, again, it's just that battle of, of self-worth um, and, and, and value. I'll pass it on. Mm -hmm. Do y'all be feeling yeah. like this sometimes, Mariah, yeah. Jay? And yeah, I was gonna say that uh, all of that, what you said, ugh, just all of the energy from Tony Michelle, just Girl. giving my life. But I think for me, you know, and the unlearning that we're constantly doing while trying to hold this work, um, the healing that we're trying to do while still doing this work and not having, um, not having competent professionals to help to help us with that healing work to help us with um the trauma that we're unpacking while also taking on more trauma right um and so a lot of us are just holding 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 so much and not feeling safe to you know for me seek therapy or seek counseling you know to to because of the experiences that I've had um, and not being comfortable enough to um, try again to seek the help that we all need and, you know, the healing that I need um, from a, from a systemic standpoint, when we, when we're trying to do this work, we're discriminated against in uh, development uh, when we're t funding, um, being trusted to lead our organization that we built, right? Being questioned, being um, um, minimized at every turn. Um, so, you know, being black, being trans, being black and non-binary, you know, not having people respect your identities or wanting you to conform to fit uh, this mold of what they think is acceptable. Um, yeah, we face that daily. Um, we're not able to express ourselves with the language that we feel free to use in some situations um, because it makes someone else uncomfortable because that's the work that they need to be doing to understand why we're speaking this way. Um, so it's so many different things and I just, ooh. It goes, it goes so many different ways because it's like, it's so deeply personal, but it's also such, in, it's so deeply embedded in these institutions uh, in these systems, um, like Tony said, we're, we're constantly showing up for and busting the door down, you know, and I just, we need like, to all the, if there are doctors listening, if there are therapists listening, Black people, we want therapy. We need therapy. We need competent, educated, uh, politicized professionals, right? 
um, that are going to help us more than they are going to harm us. Um, so yeah. Well, can I jump in on that? <laughs> because I think what you're both sharing is, I mean, it's kind of been why I wanted to talk about liberation and counseling psychology is one of our values. As Julia was sharing earlier, we have development, we have career, career got us to multicultural. And then we, we debate a lot about not if we should do social justice, but you know, sometimes it does like, oh, are you good enough? And all the virtue signaling and stuff. But when it comes down to it, kind of based on what you both are saying, you know, there is a resistance, I think, in our discipline. And, and we're therapists, counseling psychologists, we're researchers, we're advocates, we're practitioners, but there's we still have resistance about just going there all the way. And and to me, that is liberation, that we live our social justice values, that um politicized is not a bad word. How, how can we not be politicized with anti-black racism and anti-trans prejudice? And, you know, I mean, I mean, I think trans and non-binary communities have taught me to question my gender and it's been the best thing I've done for my mental health and well-being. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to jump in there a little bit because I really appreciate what you all are sharing. And I think for all of us who are in this webinar, I mean, there are, there, there are a lot of people here. I mean, what could we do like tomorrow, next week, right now, so that this conversation doesn't need to happen anymore? I mean, that's going to take a long time. But Jay, what are you thinking about this? Yeah. Um... Yo, I say to all of that that both of my sisters have already spoke to. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think I think a lot about the the, the all of the things. Um, that was a, a overwhelming question. I feel like not in a bad way, but um, yeah, overwhelming question to think about. Like, what are the continuous and and never fading obstacles um, to continuing to do this work, especially over over the years? I know we all have been. Um, I think for me, um, exhaustion is is a big thing. Um, exhaustion and also like not having space to rest, it seems like. Um, I think there's, yeah, like not, we, all of us are organizers, all of us are doing this work and also just as black people <laughs> could just be exhausted <laughs> with existing um, as black people, let alone existing as black trans folks. Um, and so I think it's, it is hard for me, um, yeah, to differentiate a lot of the time between like, am I worn out from organizing for my liberation <laughs> or is it just the oppression killing me today? You know what I mean? I'm like, it really, I, I really feel like I have my days where I have to, yeah, just like figure out uh, what is what is it that I'm like trying to get, get uh, bust through today. Um, I think one of the things for me that I'm starting to realize too, I think that um the my work in organizing um against prisons and police against the state in general and the violence of the state in general um is because of black trans women uh just wanting to name that i it, it is it has been black trans women who have um introduced me into um radical organizing um and organizing that is not only um created by the nonprofit industrial complex or or by these like formal organizations and big organizations who who have um the reps and um the clout to determine for or to say what black trans folks or black folks need um but folks actually living <laughs> um living and hustling together where we're like you know what um like we're gonna get it together and also like we're gonna make changes so that other folks don't have to get it like we've had to um and i know that mariah and myself and tony michelle all share um experiences like that i think the um something that tony michelle said earlier um brought some things up for me just around like i don't i i think there was a time where i wanted um or not even just a time, I think now still, <laughs> like I want to be an organizer for black liberation. Um, and I think I, I also happen to be a man of trans experience. Um, and I don't feel like I have the, the opportunity at this point <laughs> um, in my work to just be like, oh, yeah, I am a black man that is an organizer that has trans experience along with all these other experiences that bring me into this work, right? It has not only been um, 
having different experiences around gender that have that have politicized me or radicalized me um or made me say like yeah that um I want to be able to determine for myself what X, Y, Z looks like. I think it was also experiences of growing up poor in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, it was also experiences of seeing the ways that my that my family held um, different roles in gender, um, and also just how Black women in general um, have all, have always been queered by our society and by our, uh, and Black families in general have always been queered. Whether it be us being in multi generational households. Um, where you got your great auntie, your grandmother, and your, you know what I'm saying, your cousins all under one roof. Um, I think all of these experiences um, and things, yeah, all of those are things that I bring into my work. Um, and I think experiences that ha that led me to moments of realizing that there, it actually was not by coincidence um, that I did not feel like my life was valuable. It was not. It actually was not by coincidence that I don't have the resources that I need to thrive on a on a daily basis. Um, and having trans experience was one of the things that just happened to make a lot of those impacts worse. Um, but it's not only because of that, right? And I think. Um, yeah, just naming it as, as intersectionality, you know, a word that I know a lot of us know, um, and also that yeah, a lot of a lot of Black people, a lot of folks in general, we're we're all experiencing intersectionality, right? Before we have the the name for it, um, but you know that, and I think all Black trans people know um, that it is experiences well beyond um, our experiences of transness, our experiences around gender, um, that lead us to see that we are not in like that we're not um, invested in. Um, in our communities and in our society. So, um, yeah, I think that definitely um, just an obstacle in the, in the way that even we talk about liberation of Black trans folks, um, like, I won't necessarily say separate from Black liberation, but just the ways that we have to create that conversation, I think speak to that, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, just like, not necessarily being at that reckoning yet, or not necessarily having space for that. Of like, there are there are all of these things that bring. Um, in the same way, there's there's multiple different things that bring folks into your care, right? Like, it's not just um, it it is not just one uh, experience or or one identity that um, are causing the things that folks are bringing to y'all in y'all's care are the things that I know I will I will be talking with somebody about. Um, will have way better, I, like I'm literally I'm poor <laughs> um, and trying to and trying to get it. So like, can like how do I do X Y Z or how do I continue to get out of bed and fight for liberation when everything about this moment right now tells me that is not um, <laughs> it's not gonna happen or that I can't do it um, or that I don't have the resources or the power to do it. Um, so yeah, I think all of those <laughs> all of those things I think equally. Um, yeah, are, are things that are, are, and not by coincidence, right, things that are built to keep us out of this work. Um, and to, and those are the things that is meant for us to have to worry about more so, so that we can't actually take power away um, from folks who are in power. So, so again, it's not by coincidence that, um, yeah, we struggle with these things and that, and that most Black trans folks uh, and Black queer folks are struggling with very similar things. Um, yeah, that was it. Yeah, so much appreciation for that nuance and really challenging folks to think differently about the patterns they see in the world. Um, it's super important for all of us. And before we go to the next uh, question, I wanted to speak directly, Mariah, to your question about are there doctors and are there therapists? There most certainly are. Um, and I think it will be difficult not to hear, you know, the truth that all of you all are speaking to. Uh, so I appreciate you, you sharing it. Um, those people are most definitely listening. Um, you know, one of the things, so I'm a counseling psychologist by training, but now I'm housed in the Yale School of Public Health. And one of the things that I've noticed in both of these kind of health focused disciplines is that we have a tendency to really focus on pathology and harm and illness and despair. Uh, and we don't talk much about resiliency and liberation and radical healing. And we definitely don't talk a lot about joy. Um, and what that ends up meaning is that specifically when we talk about multiply oppressed populations and particularly black trans folks, um, you know, the community typically just becomes a sort of symbolic other that represents, you know, hyper oppression and life is horrible and awful and there's just nothing but structural disadvantage and uh, despair. Um, and I can speak for myself and say that my view of like the black queer and trans community is much more complex than that. And I'd like to invite more of that complexity into this conversation with the next question, uh, which is about what are the joys 
uh, ULC and doing liberation focused work in the organizing you do. Um, you know, who's inspiring your work? Uh, how are you finding and getting freedom outside of just the paradigm of strife and difficulty? Like, what's the beauty that you're seeing in the work and in the moment that we're in right now? Go ahead, Tony Michelle. I gotta go. We're all looking at you. <laughs> you the you joy. You the joy. Go ahead. So, you know, for me, the joy is just being able to be alive, honey. Um, especially in this time, you know, for um I I I'm a per I suffer with grief. Um, uh, my father was murdered when I was 10 years old and the family unit, which are my elders, my grandmother, grandfather, and great grandmother, um, they all passed throughout, you know, my teenage years in moments that I was in high abuse, um, lots of abuse, abusive moments with my mother, um, and the men in her life. Um, and, uh, and last year, uh, lost my stepfather um, at the age of 39. And so, honey, let me tell you, I am grateful to be in the land of the living um, and able to see my friends um, and support my friends and my sisters and brothers and siblings um, support, like facilitating, you know, their power to, you know, to like, I mean, it's just the, our beauty, our resilience, uh, the music that we that we generate, the beats, the movement that we generate, the healing that we do. I mean, it is just so fucking beautiful. Uh, the skin. The skin. And the nails that we can have on. Baby. There's so many things to be happy about. There's so many things to find joy in. Um, but that has been, that's been a lot. That's been my joy, being really, being able to see uh, my, my community thrive in, despite, in spite of. <clears throat> um, and so, yeah, thanks. Pass it to Mariah, who is, you know, gives me a lot so, of, Anita Baker Joy. Ha! Okay. <laughs> yes, I love me. We love Anita Baker. Um, uh, similar to what Tony Michelle was saying, like, I've experienced so much loss in my life. Um, and sometimes I find it hard to people that I immediately, that are immediately around me or that I really care about, I find it really hard to release a tight grip of them or let them stray too far away from me um, because my happiness is embedded in their existence and it depends on it um, because I've lost so many people in my life. Um, so my sisters bring me joy and, um, and my community members bring me joy and my culture um, here brings me joy and the experience and the fact that I get to experience it and uh, live it um, and educate others about um, the city that I live in and the wonderful people that are here that, you know, kept me alive. Um, um, I, I, I love experiencing that and bringing other people in to experience and to experience the beauty uh, of this place, which I will always call home that brings me joy. Um, working so hard and diligently to provide resources and opportunities that I didn't have that I wish I had brings me joy. My work brings me joy. Um, while also bringing so much pain at times. 
Um, and that's a reality. Um, things like this bring me joy because I know that this is um, a step in the right direction for the world we ultimately are going to live in, not that we want to live in, that we are going to live in. Um, so yeah, just being here with all of you, um, the 127 people that want to know how we, how we get to freedom together, uh, that brings me joy. Yeah, I think uh, just Echo and Tony Michelle getting to be a, a fly ass black mom um, is it, it joyous in and of itself, despite all the things. Um, I think that being able to continue legacy, um, yeah, just there's never been a time where there weren't black folks who are fighting for liberation. Um, and I, I consider it an honor to continue that. Um, and to, yeah, to dedicate my life to doing that as well. Um, knowing that I have plenty of ancestors that dedicated theirs for me. So, um, and I think that also in, in alignment with earning respect from future generations. Um, I think that young people bring me so much joy. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm like, yes, I just, just thinking about, yeah, young people bring me so much joy. I think especially seeing um, young queer and trans folks um, yeah, be able to come into themselves and determine for themselves even earlier than I was. Um, I think especially seeing it, just the the radical possibilities of young people um, continue to bring me joy because I know that even, yeah, if there is a day where Jay is tired and fed up and <laughs> can't just can't do it no more, I'm like, yeah, it's, I know it's, I, yeah, I'm a, I know it's young people I could I could think of right now who um, who gonna still be out here and continuing, um, and I think in general developing leadership, um, I think even more so than like campaigns and direct action and like the things that you like oh when we win like it feels good you know like shutting down jails and stuff like <laughs> that it'd be feeling good <laughs> um and and at the same time i think the um for me it's always i've always found even more joy in the behind the scenes i think both tony michelle and mariah tell you i'd be like all right i'm cool i don't need the cameras i i'm good on all i'm a strategy guy <laughs> call me we're ready to plan it and i'm there but otherwise y'all can have the speaking and all that um so yeah, I think even though even in that, uh, for me, it's more so about playing the roles that um, aren't seen. Just because I know, for one, especially as a black man, you know, I still I'm working to make space and create space for um, yeah, for folks who uh, are are living in non-binary genders, um, for folks who are femmes and women. And so I think um, yeah, continuing to do that and also working with other young masculine folks and young men um, to continue to make that a, a norm in our in our communities um, for folks to be able to expect, uh, yeah, to expect the things that they should be able to expect from masculine and men allies. Um, so that also brings me joy working with other masculine folks who are committed um, to feminist and black for feminist liberation. Um, and yeah, again, like Mariah was saying, moments like these, I think being able to, I yeah, I, um, it's an honor for me to be in space with both of these women. I think that, um, and know uh, all of us have had the opportunities to do different work together. Um, I know I was at Breakout when Tony Michelle was part-time at Stop Co, and we both in very different places now. So I think also being able to build relationships like these um, with folks who I don't think I would have connected with outside of organizing for liberation. So um, yeah, these are people that I know got my back and I know when we in each other's cities, we're gonna call and et cetera. And, um, so yeah, also just being able to build communities, uh, it's a lot of, I feel like a lot of my experiences just around loss weren't necessarily even because like folks weren't on this plane, but like folks made decisions not to be in my life or not to love me, um, or not to allow me to self-determine. So I think that too, is important to me to like, con yeah, to continue to build family that I do get to choose and that do continue to choose to love me. So I think that that also is something that brings me a lot of joy. Um, is that, yeah, a lot of folks in this work and that I've met through this work have chosen 
um, to love me and chosen to be a comrade of mine and chosen to be accountable to me and to have me be accountable to them. Um, and so I think those relationships and that, that family and um, that comradeship also bring me a lot of joy. You know, I just want to share before we shift to the next question how struck I was by, uh, I don't I mean, what a lesson in kind of holding all the things at the same time, right? I mean, in this question that's about joy, it was very clear. I mean, you all had a lot of levity, but there was also, um, it was very clear that under the surface and interconnected with that is also a lot of pain and a lot of grief and a lot of challenge. And just again, what a lesson in holding all the things, which I think is, has a lot to do with what it means to be a black, queer, trans person uh, today. Um, and, and, and in embracing that and understanding that probably somewhere in there is our road to freedom as well. Um, but I just want to speak to that because for me and from the comments I'm reading, I think folks are really moved um, in hearing the joy, but also hearing how it's, you know, not a, not a big step away from all of the other complexities of what it means to have to hold these identities and these positionalities in this world right now. Um, so appreciation. I know that Tony Michelle is going to have to go, but like Jay, oh my gosh, like just, I think you just help us learn so much how to have humility with the upcoming generations. And, you know, I think Mariah was nodding to like, you know, our older generations too, and just the whole legacy. So thank you for bringing that in. I think within our discipline and just, you know, as adult folks where we adult a lot on top of young folks. So thank you for reminding us. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I love Mariah when you said, you know, this is not towards the world we're um, trying to build. It's going to happen anyway. <laughs> this is the world we're going to be living in. So Tony, Michelle, I know you're going to have to go, but are there any last things um, that you want to share with us before you head out? And folks, as audience, we have another 30 minutes together or so, but I wanted to give Tony, Michelle kind of a, a space before you headed out. Yes, I do hate that I have to go. I'm hopping on another webinar um, that uh, is for the In Our Names Network, but we're talking about how we are protecting Black trans women in this time. Um, and so all of these conversations are so important. And um, I think that the only thing I want to uplift is um, just why um, the name of this workshop tonight is called um, When We Fight, We Win. Um, and so I wanted to do a quick little story set, if you were wanting that, um, to, uh, to ground us um, in the, the spirit and soul of like why this is. Um, so this week marked the fifth anniversary, death anniversary of Juan Evans. Juan Evans uh, was an organizer in Atlanta here at SNAPCO, um, one of the first Black trans people, again, to politicize and radicalize me. Um, and um, Juan was a freedom fighter. Juan was a father of three um, and a grandfather of lots of babies in the A. Um, and uh, one story is just amazing and inspires all of us. Um, in 2014, uh, Juan was arrested right um, I'm here at our office in Atlanta, but right down the street, um, Juan was stopped by an East Point officer um, and Juan disclosed his transness to the officer and informed the officer about, you know, about their identification card and told the officer that I identify as a trans man and my identification card may say something different, but this is who I am. The officers did not believe him and asked him to step out of the car where they really humili humiliated him. They, you know, uh, patted him down, didn't believe, um, wanted to question his chest area, called him it's, called him things um, in 2014. Um, and we, uh, as a community, 
marched down to the city hall and demanded an apology from the police chief and the police officers. Um, and we were successful in that. Um, and then we also were able to get them, the uh, East Point Police Department, to shift their standing operating procedures um, that were more inclusive of trans and non-binary folks um, in the city of East Point, which then we were able to work with the city of Atlanta with standard operating procedures um, and which then really started our entire trans justice movement back in 2014 um, in Atlanta. And so as we have reformed marijuana laws, implemented pre-arrest diversion uh, programs and have closed down city jails, um, we owe all of that to that moment where one was dehumanized and found his liberation um, and decided to stay in that um, and gather his people and, and directed us to fight in the ways that he wanted us to. Um, and so we allied with Juan, we love Juan. Um, and as y'all are in y'all spaces, send a little shout out and prayer to his family um, as they are holding him and memories of, of him in this time. Thank y'all so much for having me. Thank you, Tony Michelle. <laughs> we will miss you, but we'll keep, you know, we know your spirit's going to be flowing through us. And I think, you know, one more thing I'll, I'll say about Juan is just he gave us that, that cry. When we fight, we win. And I think it's a, it's a gift and it's a, it's a gut check uh, on taking all of our personal experiences and the ones we've heard tonight community, you know, we've heard a lot of joy, a lot of pain. And if we're not extractive, we get to work right tonight, tomorrow and changing policies, procedures, and we get really strategic. So we, we know you're, you're, uh, headed somewhere else, but we love you. And thank you so much, Tony, Michelle. Love you more. Have fun. <laughs> Ask the question. <laughs> You know, if Tony Michelle says that, we got to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, Em, you were about to jump in there. Thank yeah, you, and I recognize we're kind of coming to the end, so we'll try to answer a few of your questions from the audience, um, I think maybe after this. But I, I wanted to just point out this poll that Annalise, you shared um, with the group, just so that the panelists can be aware of. So the question was, did you receive training in your program so counseling psych programs um, on how to be skilled in serving black trans and non-binary communities. And 90% of folks said they no, they were not trained in this, uh, which I think is just really striking and really shows um, a lot of the issues. You know, historically, uh, psychology has caused a lot of harm uh, to trans communities and continues to cause harm when, you know, the whole intention of psychology is for healing and for increasing well-being. Um, so I thought maybe, uh, if you wanted to talk a little bit, just, I know we, you kind of mentioned like, you know, to the therapists and as psychologists, how we can, uh, you know, do better. I'm just curious if you'd be willing to share any of your experiences with psychology or with mental health as a field, um, just so that to share with us as a group. Yeah. Um, wow. So, First was the search, right, for this professional that I so desperately needed. And imagine that is so reflective of the results that I found. 90% of those people did not know what they were talking about, did not have the experiences from the expertise that they listed just through conversations with them. And then you have that 9% or that 10% there, and they were, they had the they had some experience and they, they, they knew a little bit about, you know, um, some of the issues and, and um, some of the things that I needed to really uh, talk about, but either they weren't black, they weren't brown, they weren't trans. And so now I have no one, right? And so for me, one time I did take that chance and say, you know what, take a, take a chance, you know, you know, just have faith that, you know, this person, you know, because this is something that you really need. Um, my whole life was in question, right? I came to this person and I was belittled and my actions were questioned or, well, what if you would have done this differently or 
how do you think your life would have turned out if this was the case? And it's just like, none of that is relevant, right? Don't you think that I think about what my life would have been like if, if this happened, if this wouldn't have happened, if I would have done this differently, if I wouldn't, you know, and then finally, you know, my last session with this woman, you know, I just told her to her face, I said, if I would have taken any of your advice, I would be dead right now. If I would, if I would lean to you for healing, I, it would destroy me, you know? And she couldn't understand that because I was able to affirm myself, I'm still alive. I, st I'm st I still exist. I'm still thriving because I I'm able to affirm myself. Uh, um, because I was able to 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 find representation of you know who I was as a kid, right? And she couldn't understand that. And that's one of the simplest fundamental things about trans folks is knowing that the power of affirmation you know no matter what what, what no matter what uh, socioeconomic status we're in no matter how abusive our home is no matter you know um how badly we're discriminated against if we are able to affirm ourselves that gives us the ability to start to live you know and she didn't understand that. And that was so deeply troubling to me. And I was worried so bad that, how many children have you seen, right? How many parents who so deeply wanted to, you know, affirm their children or, 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 or you know, guide their children, you know, through this, how many have you harmed? You know, so when I talked earlier about like, you know, lives are at stake and lives are in your hands and you know that's what i mean it's like as an adult it was so hard for me to deal with and so hard for me to navigate this with you but i can't imagine a teenager or a young child who who has to navigate that with a parent who is trying to navigate that with them and so that's been my experience with uh therapy and psychology and having folks continuously say things like, you know, well, Black people just don't seek therapy. That's not true. Black people don't seek therapy because they're harmed. Black people don't seek therapy because, you know, instead of trying to fundamentally understand and work with me, you're trying to tell me what the answers are. We're supposed to be working through this together and using your empathy and your training, your expertise to help me guide along to create a developmental plan to help me, you know, create a process for my life. That room that I sit in with you is supposed to be an escape. It's supposed to be somewhere where I can put all my armor down and take all my armor off and be vulnerable. But now I have to come here and be defensive all over again. So, you know, just in a in a way of speaking you're in another fight for your life and so that's what my experience has been well thank you man <laughs> thank you Mariah. um i think that yeah a lot of what you shared was um has been what's kept me from seeking care um i think uh, it's literally, I've been seeing somebody for probably not even two months now. Um, and yeah, for the first time ever. Um, and it was, it's because of a lot of the experiences that I heard from um, my comrades and my sisters and siblings um, who are queer and trained who um, have continued to find that like there's not space for all of the things that we want to or need to be able to bring into that space. Um, I think for me, it's been um, multiple levels of things. I think the, 
Um, so like mandated reporting is really scary. Um, and it's something that I think about a lot when it comes to just seeking care in general. Um, so I think just naming that, that had a lot to do with, um, me not, see, are not feeling comfortable with the, uh, with what I did have access to before. Um, now I've chosen to see someone who is totally capable and has all the training and chooses not to be licensed. Um, so that they don't have to do that um, mandated reporting. Um, and I think so even that as an example for me is um, that that was the, I was lucky to find someone who is Black and Indigenous of trans experience, trans masculine, and also has all of this training, um, and also an abolitionist. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I think the, yeah, I literally, I, I know that that is like, I'm I'm hella yeah um, um I don't even want to say lucky I'm very fortunate um to have to have found that them as a resource and also to be able to share that with other folks in in my community I think also um yeah just recognizing that there's a lot about um seeking care or even mandated reporting that I think is is also out of y'all's control in a lot of situations um um as folks who are who are providing care and i think there is like more conversation to be had as to like where certain policies lie or like who has the power to make certain changes when it comes to like our overall systems of care and like the different things that folks do have to do for y'all because at the end of the day like capitalism and the power of the state is like oppressive to everyone right so also understanding that like you all um as folks trying to give care are also like coming into contact with the, the um, oppression of the state um, and will the more that y'all try to to have a liberatory practice right so just naming that um, and that that is y'all's work <laughs> like that, you know uh, like as an organizer I have mine uh, and that's campaigns and organizing direct action I think is folks who um, have chosen to, to thrive in y'all's field that that is the responsibility of y'all too um, to continue to push back against um, the ways in, that the state in many ways um, oppresses folks through your care. Uh, yeah, I'm with using y'all as like tools of oppression um, with the different things that you have to do. I know that that has a lot to do with, with a lot of my experiences and struggle. Um, I know for me, it's been um, very frightening to think about having to go into a room uh, with someone and explain all of the nuances of my experiences or my identities or just but yeah, also knowing, um, yeah, there's just, just so many different points in my life, right? Like I can go home and like at home, I'm not Jay, the trans man organizer who like for blah, 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 right? Um, and I, I have like multiple relationships that I need healing around when it comes to like my upbringing and being at home. And also um, that a lot of the things that I also want to process and, and heal from um, are this like Jay, the organizer, et cetera. And so I think just knowing that I was just feeling like I had to go into a room um, and explain all of that or figure out ways to put all of that into words um, to then get to like, okay, now I can actually talk to you about something that I've explained all of these different identities that I have. Um, yeah, whether it be that like I'm doing survival work and I don't want you to tell it, you know, I, mean, I don't want to have to worry about when I leave here, if I have to worry about you knowing that. Um, or yeah, if I do say like, I, I feel like I have to, I need to harm myself or harm somebody else. Like what are the other resources that are available outside of calling the police who are more likely to harm me than I probably am any of the people that I mentioned. Um, and so even thinking of, like stuff like that is the things that have kept me, um, in the past from not seeking care. And I, again, I'm fortunate to have found someone who is in alignment with my, my values and, and does have the politic to be able to, um, show up in that way for me and also has made very specific decisions right not to be licensed so that they don't have to mandate uh, or they don't have to report um and i think and not and that isn't the decision for everyone i'm sure and also um just thinking about what are the pieces um are, are the opportunities for y'all to push back around the um the power of the state in y'all's practice and how y'all are able to create um liberatory spaces for people um in your care you know, I really appreciate you, you both speaking uh, in different ways to really naming whose work this is. Um, and I mean, one thing that really stuck out and, you know, that was just, just spoken about 
I don't know. I mean, it's kind of wild thinking about how, I, I mean, and I related to it, how feeling fortunate for finding someone who, you know, basically just looks like you and doesn't dehumanize you, right? Um, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, and, and, and I'm sure this is a wonderful practitioner, but, it's, but that in itself is difficult and a low bar, um, you know, like in terms of what queer, trans, black folks are asking for is that. And, you know, I mean, I do a lot of the work that I do, I do because I believe in this, you know, novel, controversial belief that folks from marginalized communities should not only be the subjects of research and our patients and our clients, but that folks from the margins should be doing and leading uh, research and doing and leading clinical work and frankly doing that that liberation work. Um, and so I appreciate uh, the reminder uh, that we need to continue that. Um, I think we have a, just about nine minutes left and we're gonna shift uh, to question and answer. Um, in doing that, I wanna just recognize what we just heard, which is, you know, this point about whose work is this really to do. And so I actually want to make a little impromptu um, uh, shift to how we engage with these questions is that I'm going to throw out a question or two from the audience. But while you all are doing the work of answering it, I invite those that are watching to also um, explore what answers you all know as well um, and to share that in the chat. So attendees uh, that are grappling with these questions um, can also right now live start to pick up the work of digging deep and learning what resources you already have within you uh, to to teach alongside those that are here as our panelists today. Um, but I'll shift into some of those now. And so I have a few questions here. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask I'm gonna ask them in tandem, like together, because they actually all are a question about what we can really do um, as counseling psychologists to center and truly serve um, queer and trans folks of color, black folks, traditionally marginalized communities, historically marginalized folks. Um, so one question that was uh, quite tangible is um, in reimagining what it would mean for therapy to be liberatory, what would a safe liberatory healing space look like for black trans folks? I'm gonna ask that again. So in reimagining what it would mean for therapy to be liberatory, what would a safe liberatory healing space look like for black trans folks? And again, I wanna invite not just the speakers to share, but maybe folks who are from within those communities or who are doing work on the ground with these communities that are listening in, panelists, community members outside of psychology, anybody who's a part of this that has ideas to also do the work and sharing that in the chat. Um, Hold this. I'm going to throw out one more piece as well. Um, so this comment says, uh, Mariah mentioned giving voice in rooms that they cannot. So our work of really speaking and giving voice to these issues, these communities. Um, and a request to hear the panelists' top thing that we can give voice to in these rooms. So I'm sharing these two things together. What, are this, what does the space look like? And what do our voices sound like uh, in terms of advocating and centering communities uh, that, are, that are marginalized? Um, I think first thing that comes up for me as far, I don't know if this is, I don't know if I could give you like a top two for real. Um, but the, the first thing that come up for me, I feel like is resources. Um, to be actually investing tangible, usable resources um, into Black trans folks, not only into Black trans folks' care, especially into the care for Black trans folks, but in general, um, understanding that if Black trans folks don't have housing, they're not coming to therapy. <laughs> if they don't have jobs, if they don't have health care, if they don't have insurance, et cetera, they're not coming. Um, so I think that off the, just off top, if, yeah, just needing to invest in Black trans communities um, so that folks can seek access to different kinds of care because they're actually surviving. Um, and I think uh, also with that, investing in getting more folks into your field and in leadership, um, like I think you mentioned earlier, Skylar, and um, having more Black trans folks in leadership around your field um, in different positions that are working with you, that are helping to create programs or whatever, um, so that folks are actually at the table as well. 
um, and able to get, to bring like to give voice themselves, um, like was mentioned in the other question. Um, Mariah, do you want to speak to that before going to the other question? Um, yeah. For people who are not, or for professionals that aren't Black, recognizing your anti-Blackness um, in your language, in your, uh, in your organizations, in your practices, um, dismantling racism um, in these structures, in, in these complexes. Um, I think the number one thing that, you know, you can do for, oh, or the number one thing you can do to uplift our voices in rooms that we're not in, identify what room this is and identify how it has severely impacted our community, right? And if it hasn't, and if you don't know if it's uh, severely impacted our community, learn how you can make it more equitable so that we now have access to this. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I, and, and Jay pretty much touched on a lot of the other things, but yeah, resources, you know, um, understanding how the, the resources out there are, you know, oftentimes funneled away from our communities um, and how you can help, um, how you can help to dismantle that and how you can help to redirect those resources to us um yeah i love this discussion of both the resource point these real like structural barriers and also the pipeline issue and it's interesting because those things are actually quite connected because just like you said if you don't have housing um if you don't have financial means if you don't have the support if you don't have access to education and healthcare, you're not coming to, to therapy secret here uh, you're also not entering graduate school and graduate programs and, and entering and applying to be in counseling psychology. So those same structural barriers that we talk about for our clients are also creating a much earlier leak in this pipeline uh, where those folks aren't in a position to show up uh, in our program application pool and whatnot. So I just wanted to speak to the, that, that deep connection and implications for us as a field as we are trying to diversify and think more in a more liberatory fashion about who we bring into counseling psych. So I have one one more thing to add to that really short and quickly. Yeah, definitely. That, um, I, we talked about the dehumanizing experience. Um, stop treating us like patients. Um, stop presenting our community as patients and start humanizing our experience um, and start thinking of, of us as a family member or a friend, you know, and how that would directly impact you. Um, and then I think it would allow you to speak more passionately about our issues um, in the rooms that we're not. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I don't want this conversation to end. And I, I just, wow, my I think a lot of people were talking about their hearts breaking on the chat box, but I feel like when our hearts break, they have the potential to break wider open and to make more change. Um, I don't really have the words um, to say how grateful I feel for this conversation for Skylar and M's co-moderators, Mariah, Jay, Tony, Michelle, for your work. I mean, there's so many notes I took for myself, um, but like things that really stand out, you've got to be rooted in your own liberation. You know, it's a both and self-determination Jay talked about, you know, black folks, black trans folks. I mean, they're going, whether it's OG or big mama, communities are working it out, but what does it mean as Mariah is saying to, to humanize ourselves. Like we shouldn't have to humanize <laughs> uh, these issues because as Tony Michelle said, the healing we do is so fucking beautiful. And y'all are gonna do that no matter how foolish we act. Uh, but I saw a lot in the chat box of people wanting to do some things differently. So my challenge to all of us, there are a lot of us here, you know, put in the chat box what you're willing to do differently. I saw some people talking about apologies. You know, I want us to, think about deep apologies, but I want us to fund this work. 
So I put the House of Tulips, Snapco in there, make a monthly contribution, put your money there. I drop the link to the New York Times reparations article. You know, start thinking about reparations for black communities. I mean, if we talk about numbers, it's 150,000, 170,000 at least for black descendants of uh, white enslavers, you know, who have experienced um, enslavers from uh, enslavement from white folks. So, I mean, these are hard conversations to lean in, but I wonder about if we can move away from this idea of a pipeline, because, you know, m has been working on that so much in Counseling Psych, we've got a whole special task group on that, but it's going to take so long to get a pipeline. We need a nexus. We need to just like bypass all the bylaws and, and just, you know, Jay was saying like, you know, have black trans leaders in your orgs. I mean, we're, we're not ready, but we got to get ready and we got to pay for that expertise. Like, you know, mm -hmm. like tonight, it's important. So um, folks in the chat box, I know we're a minute over, but if you could drop one word for how you all felt, um, you know, or feel now after, um, you know, listening to Jay, Mariah, and Tony, Michelle, I think those words will give you the chat box too, Mariah and Jay, Jay are so important, inspired, grateful, honored, love, grateful, humble, thankful, ready to work, inspired, motivated. And I'm going to ask Julia and Carmen to come on, um, ready to work, Linda says, moved, energized, empowered, humbled, refilled. Um, and ask Carmen and Julia to come back on and just close us out. This is our last 75th anniversary webinar. And, you know, I think we had this originally as the Saturday morning keynote because we knew this is exactly we, where we wanted to end this formal conversation, but not our work. So Julia, Carmen, are there any last words you want to share? Just deep gratitude. Thank you so much to each of you. And I know, uh, I know Carmen is having a little trouble with her video, but there she is. There she is. It wasn't letting me get back, so I'm glad to be back with you all. Um, counseling site community, thank you for listening and thanks for showing up. Show this video in your classes forever. Like, just show it. And, you know, we praise you for your work. I just really want to tell the both of you and Tony Michelle, thank you for your personhood and authenticity. Like it couldn't have been better. And we're just grateful as a collective. So thank you. And I look for you on Instagram. <laughs> for sure, for sure. <laughs> Big love to you all. Look forward to seeing you in New Orleans. <laughs> as Arundhati Roy says, you know, a better day is coming. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. And she also said the pandemic is a portal. We're not going back to the world that we were in, but we can sure as hell build the world we want to see. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Mariah. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, M, Skylar, Julia, Carmen. I love each of you so much. Thank you, thank you. And we'll be following you. <laughs> Have a good evening, everyone. Take, Take care, care, everyone. Big love. Thank you. Bye.